work it, make it, do it, make sense. Let's get started. If you are here for um, the programming language Go, well, no. We're not going to talk about Go. We're going to talk about AlphaGo and a lot of other things. Um, let's look at the topics. We're going to start with a very simple tree game, and this tree game will teach us how a tree search works and how Minimax uh, algorithms work. Then we'll move to knots and crosses, and we'll learn about perfect information and game theory. Then we'll make a jump to chess, and we'll look at forward and backwards pruning and alpha beta pruning. And finally, we'll jump to Go, the hardest game in this list. And we'll learn about Monte Carlo tree search and the neural networks that are currently working in AlphaGo. So I want to play a game. The game we're going to play has a tree-like structure. You're lucky because you can always start. And your aim is to get the highest score. And this is not a jigsaw reference. So this is our game. You start at the top. You can go either left or right. And your goal is to get the highest score. This is pretty trivial. We pick five, because that's higher than three. So we go to the left. But now, all of a sudden, it isn't trivial anymore. So first it's our turn. We can go left or right. And then it's the opponent's turn which can go left or right, and then it's our turn again. So what do we need to do to get to the highest score? Well, we can say, well, maybe if we go towards the nine, that's, that's the highest one. But yeah, there's also a two next to it. If you use Minimax, this is very easy to solve. It's a very simple algorithm that basically fills up the tree with values, and it will determine what you should do. Minimax stands for you minimize the maximum score. And that's when it's the opponent's turn. And when it's your turn, you obviously try to maximize, uh, you try to maximize the minimum score. This is basically perfect play. So let's go back to the example. We'll start at the bottom. That's our turn. So we will obviously pick the highest value. This is trivial. And when you move up one level, it's the opponent's turn. The opponent will always pick the lowest value. So between 5 and 9, the opponent will pick 5. And between 4 and 8, the opponent will pick 4. The top one, it's our turn again. So we have to decide between 5 and 4. 5 is best. So in this game, if both players play perfectly, we'll end up at 5. In a nutshell, this is Minimax, and this is how almost all the game search algorithms work, with variations. But it's a Java conference, so we need Java. This is Java. This is how you write the Minimax algorithm. It's a recursive method. Um, you start out with a starting node and a Boolean if you're maximizing or minimizing the score. If it's an end node, a leave node, a bottom node, we'll just return the value of that node. And otherwise, um, we initialize the best score with either the minimum value or the maximum value of an integer, depending on if we're minimizing or maximizing our value. And we'll walk all the child nodes. For each child node, we recursively calculate the score, and we flip the maximizing to minimizing and minimizing to maximizing with the exclamation mark. And if we're maximizing, we update our best score. And if we're uh, minimizing, we'll update our best score. And that's what we return. So this code basically makes this tree. So our game, it has a branching factor of two. At each step, we split in two. The game depth, in this case, was three, because we have three layers. We have three times a decision before the end. And we have perfect information. And perfect information means both players know eventually what you'll end up with. It's too easy to see to the end. Both players will know that. 
And in, in such a case, Minimax is just works perfectly. So, what do you need if you want to make a program that plays computer games? Or board games, in this case. You need, first need a way to generate all the valid moves. So if you want to make a chess playing bot, you'll need a chess engine which knows all the chess rules and which tells you all the different kind of moves you can make from a certain position. This is very game specific. The second thing you need is a way to evaluate the nodes. Um, in, in case of, for example, tic-tac-toe, the evaluation can be very simple. You just go to the end, you see who won. But in case of chess, for example, you can't calculate every final position, so you need some other way to evaluate the node. So you need to weigh it. This is also game specific. The final thing you need is a way to pick a part in the tree. And this is completely game agnostic. It doesn't really matter uh, which, which game you're playing, if you're playing tic-tac-toe, chess, go. The algorithms to pick a path, like Minimax we just showed, are agnostic. Let's look at another game, Knots and Crosses, which in Dutch is butter, cheese, and eggs, which makes no sense at all to me. <laughs> Knots and Crosses completely describes the game, butter, cheese, and eggs, no idea, but it's a true story. That's what we call it, butter, cheese, and eggs. So, nuts and crosses. If we would draw the entire tree, we'll start up with an empty, empty board, and then there are nine possibilities. So we can either put it in the top left square, the top middle square, the top right square, etc., etc., etc. And after that, there are eight possible choices, and after that, there are seven possible choices. After that, six possible. But that tree is too large, wouldn't fit on my slide, so. We can forget that. It's a large tree if you would draw it on paper, but it's not that large. For a computer, it's very easy to just calculate to the end. And we can do that, and we can assign a value, like I said. If we win, pick one. If we have a tie, zero. If we lose, minus one. If we do that, and we play to the end, and we apply minimax like we did before, you've solved the game, you've solved tic-tac-toe, and you can play it perfectly. Tic-tac-toe, or knots and crosses, has a bracing factor of five, on average. So the first step, you've got nine possible choices, then there are eight, then there are seven, then there are six, and finally there's just one position you can put it in. So on average, it has a bracing factor of five. So at each step, there are five possibilities. Yes? Yes, coming to that. Okay. The maximum depth is nine, but you can lose sooner or win sooner. So sometimes it, you just get up to seven or eight. And if you remove all the symmetries, because there are a lot of symmetries in, uh, in tic-tac-toe, for example, if you put it in a corner, it doesn't really matter which corner, um, there are just 138 terminal positions. And interestingly, if you start with X, you can win 91 times. Um, the opponent, you can lose 44 times, and there are just three terminal positions which end, which end up in a draw. But if you play perfectly, and you, if you apply minimax, the funny thing is you always end up in a draw. If both players play perfectly and you counter each, uh, each other, you always end up in one of the three tying positions which is kind of surprising, but yeah, that's how it works. You can never force a win. So if both players play perfectly, you end up in a tie. If one makes a mistake, you can win or lose. Next game, chess. The noble game of chess. If you would draw the entire tree for chess, this is what you will start up. You'll start with an empty chessboard, and then there are 20 different moves you can make from an empty chessboard. And below that, there are 20 more moves the opponent can make, and obviously this quickly becomes very large. It becomes that large, J just look at this table. If you start at depth zero, which is an empty board, there's just one single note, that's the empty board. 
At depth one, there are 20 different moves you could make. Depth two, the opponent makes a move. He or she can also make 20 moves. So that makes a combination of 400 nodes. And this quickly grows until after just six moves, you're already at 119 million different positions. And surprisingly, if you look at this table, you can see there are a lot of captures possible, but also checkmates. So for example, after four moves, you can checkmate someone in chess. I didn't know that, but this table says it, uh, it does. These tables are very handy. I wrote my own chess engine. Um, and these tables are very cool for two reasons. First, bragging rights. Um, because it's very easy to implement once you have a chess engine, just make all the moves for each move, do all the moves for each move, do all the moves. There's three lines of code. And you'll quickly see um, at depth six, if it takes a couple of minutes, a couple of milliseconds. So you can compare the speed of your chess engine to other chess engines. The second thing is, it's like the perfect integration test. Because when I was writing my chess engine, I would end up, depth six will be 119060322. So my chess engine was missing some corner case rule which ruled out maybe two nodes. But yeah, <laughs> those are kind of critical. So I didn't correctly implement all the rules. And there are other tables like this. So this is uh, a table from an empty position. But there are also tables which have a lot of castling and promotions and checks. And you can use that as like an integration test to test if your chess engine is, is correct, correctly implemented. So what's the problem with chess? Well, there's no perfect information. The entire tree for chess is too large. You can't just compute every single end node and work your way up using Minimax and find out what the perfect play is. It's impossible, it's too large. So we need to, at some point, stop evaluating and give a node a value. We have to evaluate that node. Turns out in chess it's very easy. You count the pieces. If grandmasters are talking to each other and they're analyzing a board, they will always say he is maybe one and a half pawn uh, in front. He's winning by two pawns, which is, a, which is very, if, if you're ahead two pawns, you'll probably win the game. That's, that's a big margin. So basically you can count pieces, but you can do other things. For example, you can evaluate the positions on the board. In chess, having uh, positions in the middle is stronger than having positions on the outside, so you can evaluate those higher. And you have things like where you pin down a certain chess piece, that's very powerful because the opponent can't move that chess piece because at that point you can uh, take another piece. So writing an evaluation function for chess, easy-ish. But there's the horizon problem. If you go down the tree and you evaluate a node, you have no idea what happens next. So at some point you have to stop thinking about what happens next and just give it a number. Maybe the next move is a checkmate. We don't know, we stopped evaluating. That's the horizon problem. You, you just look up to one horizon, and what happens behind that? No idea. So it's very powerful to look a bit further. And to do that, you need either more time, computer time, or you need to do some pruning. We need to cut back the tree. Some branches are more valuable than other branches. There's forward pruning, which is risky, and there's backward pruning, which is safe. I'll go into those now. What is forward pruning? If a move is very bad, just don't look, don't look any further. Just stop evaluating at that point. If you sacrifice your queen in, 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 after 10 moves, there's no need to look at all the notes behind that. Just, we're not gonna do that. On the other hand, if a move is too good for you, also don't evaluate. The opponent also won't give up his or her queen early in the game and then evaluate everything. It Because that's not a scenario that's unlikely to happen. But like I said, pruning is dangerous. Because sometimes 
if the opponent sacrifices his or her queen, and maybe he or she thought of something very clever, and eventually they can win. But if you stop evaluating, you won't, you won't, you won't see that. That's the horizon problem. But by cutting back the tree, you are able to go further and deeper in other interesting branches. Luckily, there's also alpha beta pruning, which is a safe way, a mathematical safe way to eliminate nodes. For me, alpha beta pruning, every time I have to relearn it and, and check how it works, but with these slides, all of you will understand alpha beta pruning. So, this is a game tree. There's a minimizing move and a maximizing move, and behind that, there are a lot of other nodes. So, we've went down the path, and uh, we've come up from here, and we found a, a tree. And, well, we can just put our tree right here. Now, we're not done yet, because there's another node. We go down there, we evaluate it, and you end up with a five. It's our maximizing turn, so we go to the five instead of the three, because we want our highest score, we want the five. This branch is done, so we move the five up. And now we go down the other path, and the first branch we hit will end up with a nine. We go back up, and we have a nine. And at this point, you can stop. This is alpha beta pruning. So there are two things that can happen. If you go down here, if the number is lower, nothing will happen because this is a maximizing move. If it's lower, this will always stay a nine. What happens if it's higher? Well, if it's higher, if it's an 11 or a 12, or this number will change, but this number won't change because this is a minimizing move and we've already got five here. So because this is a five and this is higher, it doesn't matter what happens below this. You can just completely forget that. There's no way that five will change, that five will stay there forever. It also works the other way around, if the minimax were reversed. In this case, we have a maximizing move, which has a five, and there's a lower value below that. And no matter what happens, that number will never grow higher than three, it will only go lower, because that's a minimizing move. So there are safe ways to stop evaluating nodes, and you can do this using alpha beta pruning. But Roy, that's probably very hard to implement. No, it's not, because we already had minimax. This, we've seen this before, and this is still minimax. So the gray things are the only things we need to add. The first thing we need to add is alpha and beta. Just two values. The next thing we need to add is when we're maximizing the score, we update alpha, and when we're minimizing the score, we update beta. So that's easy enough. And there's a cutoff point. If beta is larger than alpha, stop. That's the only thing. Just with three extra lines, we've now greatly increased the speed of our minimax search. We're stopping evaluation when we safely can, and this isn't risky. We're, we aren't throwing away stuff that, that, that... So this is a completely safe way of pruning. So, chess. If you want to make a chess bot, I made the chess bot. Uh, I had a colleague who was, he's 60 years old and he's been playing chess for 40 years or something, has an ELO of 2200, which is pretty good. Um, and in one weekend I decided to write a chess engine, which I did. Next I wrote a very simple evaluation function, just count the pieces and a little bit about where they are on the board. And I slept on that alpha beta search I just showed you, and I was able to beat my colleague, which of course he didn't like, um, because he had invested 40 years of his life learning chess, but yeah, and then that little Brad comes along with his chess engine and he got beat. But it's that easy. Chess has been solved. 
Some numbers. Chess, on average, has a branching factor of 35. So that's much higher than tic-tac-toe. And an average game lasts for 40 to 50 moves. Games can go on a lot further. You can have games of 100 plus moves, but on average, after 40, 50, a chess game is done. And a uh, if you want to, uh, to make an evaluation function, that's easy. We just showed you just count the pieces, you look at the positions on the board, that's okay. And with those things, and a little bit of aggressive pruning, um, always the, the, the safe back, uh, backwards pruning, but also forward pruning, chess engines of chess AIs can look 20 moves ahead. And that's enough to beat any grandmaster. The final game, Go. For those of you who don't play Go, Go has a board of 19 by 19. You have black and white stones, and your goal is to surround and capture areas on the board. I've never played Go, but I kind of understand the rules, but it's, it's, it's a hard game. So why is this so hard? It sounds simpler than chess. Chess has all those different pieces which can do different moves, but it's all in the numbers. Because the first problem is the branching factor. Where chess has a branching factor of 35, Go, on average, has a branching factor of 250. So at each given point in time, there are 250 different valid moves you can make instead of 35. The second problem is a game lasts much longer, 300 moves instead of 50 moves. So in chess, you have 35 times 35 times 35, that 50 times. This is 250 times 250, 300 times. Those of you who studied math understand that's, that's kind of a problem. The final thing is an evaluation function for Go is non-trivial. If you ask experts who's winning, they look at the board and they say, well, my intuition tells me that he or she is winning. Why do you think that? Yes, I'm not quite sure, it's intuition. <laughs> they can't really qualify it. Because the problem is, if you surround an area and you're like 90% there, you can't count that. Maybe it's impossible to capture that area, but it looks promising, but that doesn't say anything. Sometimes it's obvious that, that you can't really capture that, so you can't just... Basically, there's no real evaluation function. This is the number of possible moves you can make on, an, uh, on a Go board. And like I said, it's larger than the amount of atoms in the entire universe. So it's kind of impossible to calculate all the way to the end. One solution for this is the Monte Carlo tree search. When I say Monte Carlo, what do you think of? For me, it's Formula One and, and the harbor, but most people also say the casino. And that's why it's called the Monte Carlo tree search. Because what do we do? We pick a node, and we play randomly to the end. And we do this as, this as often as possible. And just by playing randomly to the end, we can see if we won 20% of the times, or 40% of the times, or maybe 60% of the times. This gives, us an, this gives us an indication of the strength of this particular node we picked. So if for each of the nodes we play to the end, we look at the statistics, well, we'll just go with the one that won most of the time, or lost least of the time. That way you don't have to write an evaluation function. You don't have to exhaustively search everything. But yeah, it's kind of random. And that's why experts said, just two years ago, it will probably take 10 to 15 years before a computer can beat a professional Go player. They were wrong. Forget that. Because suddenly, AlphaGo came around. Ah, oh, poor baby. <laughs> and AlphaGo is using neural networks. So what is a neural network? A neural network is a computer model designed to simulate the behavior of your own biological brains. Time for a short demo.
maybe, perhaps. Where are you? No. There you are. What you can see here is um, the playground of TensorFlow. TensorFlow is a library or framework, library, framework, well, whatever, where you can um, implement uh, neural networks on a very easy way. And using this uh, playground, you can just play around and get a feel for what actually goes on inside a neural network. So let's just delete everything here. Let's, no, let's just delete all layers. And let's delete this. Here we have our data. This is our input. So right here you can see there are orange dots and blue dots. And the goal of this playground, the neural network, is to separate the blue dots from the orange dots. Right here we have certain features. So for example, we have a vertical line. And we can even, uh, we can get rid of this. Oh, we can, yeah. So we have a vertical line. If we play, well, nothing happens, obviously. But we can add a hidden node. And we'll add just a single node. So what can this node do? Hey, it's work it isn't working. Wait. Uh, a refresh works. So what happens now? We have one line, a vertical line, and this node has a certain weight to it. And that weight moves the line left or right. And as you can see, in this, this case, it tries to separate the orange from the blue. So it found a region with orange and a region with blue and orange. But using this input, the only thing it can do is move left or right. If we add another hidden neuron, you can see the network is now able to make two vertical lines. So it can separate out more orange from blue. Another possibility is that we have multiple inputs. So what happens if we have an X input and a, a vertical input and a horizontal input? If we add a random weight to this, it's kind of broken. I don't know what happened. Here. You can see it can now combine those two inputs with a single output. That way it can make diagonal lines. That's because these two inputs combined in a certain way makes a diagonal line. If we have two diagonal lines, so two inputs, two hidden nodes, it's able to, to do even better than just having two vertical lines. And this solution can be solved completely by adding a final hidden node, which has weight. And right now, the neural network is able to separate every orange bit from the blue bit. So basically, that's how neural networks work. It's just a set of weights and inputs. And with that, you can solve problems. But yeah, a different problem with the same neural network kind of works, but kind of doesn't. So you might say, well, let's just make a bigger neural network. Just add some hidden layers, connect everything up, make a big brain, and we'll solve it. In this case, it does, but sometimes, but it takes much longer. Obviously, if you make the brain big enough, it will be able to solve this, but it will take much, much longer because every node is doing random things and is being adjusted, and in this case, it isn't even solving it. Or maybe it is, maybe it isn't. It doesn't know what to do. So bigger isn't always better. Back to the slides. This is just, just to give you an idea of how a neural network works. Where is my cursor? Oh, there it is. If you want more information on neural networks and machine learning and that kind of stuff, visit TensorFlow. TensorFlow, with its playground, it's very easy to get started. 
if you want to do Java, you can go to Deep Learning for J, which is a neural network uh, library for Java. And there are a lot of others. You've got Cafe, Torch, Theno. There's a lot to find on the internet. But how does AlphaGo work? How can you use neural networks to play Go? Well, something about those neural networks. Um, the neural networks used in AlphaGo are convolutional neural networks. That means they break up the problem into smaller pieces. Those are evaluated uh, with each layer and they're propagated back. The learning is supervised, which means that every time uh, one thing is evaluated, the entire uh, neural network is being adjusted. So it isn't being adjusted layer by layer, but it's being adjusted after it receives uh, a loop. And I just learned AlphaGo has 13 layers, which doesn't sound like much, but you could already see that we had like 10 layers just yet. But they have a lot more neurons and a lot more convolutional pieces. They created a lot of neural networks, four in particular. The first one they made, they took the neural network and they took 30 million amateur matches. And they gave the neural network a goal, predict the next move. So the input is all the matches, and the output for each single uh, board position is give me the next move. The input is uh, a board position, so a complete uh, Go board. And it was correct in 57% of the time, which doesn't sound like a lot, but actually it is. This neuro yeah. Uh, we know w what the amateur matches uh, did, so we can just give it a position. We ask it, okay, neural network, what do you think is the next move? It will say this move, and then we can see what the amateur actually did. So then we can teach the neural network what an amateur would do. Yes. The second neural network, they took a copy of the supervised network we just saw, and they set it a new goal, predict the best move. Not the amateur move, but the best move. Exactly what you were hinting at. This network played itself. So it was learning by self-play. Um, small variations of itself were playing each other, and the one which had a better move got better, and the one that didn't have a better move died. That's what they, uh, using self-play, they tried to find the best move. So instead of predicting what the amateur did, they were trying to find better solutions. Then they played against Pachi. Pachi is uh, um, a Go AI, which is using the Monte Carlo tree search we saw earlier. It isn't the best, it is just a AI, a well-known AI. And it could win 85% of the time. Just this neural network, just give it a board position, predict the next move, which is pretty, pretty impressive. This reinforced network is a bit slow. To evaluate one board, it would take three milliseconds, which doesn't sound slow, but it is. Especially if you want to do Monte Carlo tree shirts. If you want to use that network to predict a move, predict a move, predict a move, all the way to the end, and keep doing that, it's just too slow. So they made a smaller network, and they trained it at the same way, and this network is less correct, less good, but marginally, but it's much faster. So it takes, I don't know what that is, two microseconds. It's 1,500 times faster. Finally, they, 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 they weren't done. They made a fourth neural network, and this is the value network. So they took the same 30 million matches, and for each position, they asked the neural network, predict the winner based on this board. So basically, right now, this neural network is being trained to be an evaluation function. Initially, it had an error of 37, where 0.5 is random. So it could predict something. Then they did the, the, the same trick as before with self-play, and the error came down to 0.5. 23. They decided to test this network. How do you test this network? Well, for a given board, generate all possible moves. For each of those moves, evaluate and see who's winning. 
and the one that has the highest likelihood of us winning, pick that move and play the move. This was able to be the strongest known AI uh, that was currently written for Go. And this is still without any tree search. So just one single depth, look at the nodes, evaluate, and go. Then they went on to combine all the pieces. So they're using the policy network to look at the best moves. They're using the value network to check this for those moves, which of the moves have the highest probability of us winning. And then they used the fast rollout network, the, the one 1,500 times faster, to just Monte Carlo play to the end and see if it's actually a good move. And those three values are combined, and those three values together uh, decide which move AlphaGo is going to play. And this was working very well. So they set up a challenge. That guy is Lee Sedol, and he is considered to be the best Go player of his decade. At that time uh, of the challenge, he wasn't the number one in the world. I think he was number four or five, but he's been very consistent. He's been in the top five for 10 plus years. So he's like the Roger Federer of Go. AlphaGo is playing a best of five, and the winner gets a million, just, just so Lee Sedol tries his best. The Challenger is a distributed version of AlphaGo with some mighty hardware, 1202 CPUs, 176 GPUs, and the game started. Lee Sedol was pretty convinced he would win because the experts were saying, it will take 10 to 15 years, you don't have to worry. Go on, spend that million, it's yours. And right here you can see um, a lot of things, but you can see AlphaGo's minion. So AlphaGo is the computer screen, that's his minion that actually places the thing on the board, and on the opposite end is Lee Sedol. And game one started, and they were playing, and well, yeah, they were doing pretty standard things, until move 102, and that's when Lee Sedol looked at the board, and he realized something. Let's look at what happened. Because at one, move 102, he realized he might not win this. His jaw dropped, literally. And he froze for three seconds. Like, his mind is currently breaking. Ah, okay. <laughs> and he still can't grasp it. He didn't, he didn't expect this. He's like completely flabbergasted. <laughs> and he went on to lose this game, which was already a shock. Game two was also very interesting. Um, if you look at chess, Chess in the last 15 years has evolved a lot with the rise of computer chess. If you look 20 years ago, chess was pretty normal. Everyone was playing the same openings. They were just standard things you do. But computer chess changed that. Computer chess really opened up the game for new creative ideas and new ways to play, and it really evolved the game. And experts are saying the same thing might happen with AlphaGo. And uh, this became apparent in game number two, move 37. Um, you can see the, the, the reporters, they are reporting the game, and AlphaGo makes an unexpected move. Just look at, look at their reaction. And it changes the value of an area when you have a strong group. You like can see this, AlphaGo already played the black move, but it they haven't seen it yet. So strong. And this is what uh, Thore from the, uh, from the Google uh, team was talking about, uh, is this kind of, of evaluation. Evaluation. Uh, no. Uh, value. Uh, huh? Ooh. That's a very that's Ooh. a very surprising move. <laughs> I thought <laughs> I thought it was I thought it was a mistake. Um, well, I, I thought it was a quick miss, but um, a click. Since, if we were online yeah, go, we right, call yeah. it a click -o. Yeah, it's a very strange. Something like this would be a more normal yeah, move. Yeah. Then they just go on. Um, to, we expected this. this, this um, we, okay, this you're going to have to. So. Yeah. 
Do you well, have to think about this? Kind of they really did, ex um, did, did, did They couldn't explain this. Locally. They couldn't explain what's happening. Um, but the European champion said after the game, this was not a human move. I've never seen a human play this move. It was so beautiful. And this for the first time is when the game of Go is changing. It's being played in a more creative way. And this is something that's probably going to happen to this game as well. The same thing has happened to chess. Game four came. The first three were lost by Lee Sedol. Um, and there's the famous move 78. And Gu Li, who is Lee's arch rifle, said, this move was made with the hand of God. And it's a move made by Lee Sedol. This wasn't a move made by AlphaGo. And in this case, it was Lee Sedol who made a very surprising move. And that probably caught AlphaGo off guard. Because game four, after this move, the game changed so much that Lee Sudol had the upper hand and was able to win from AlphaGo. But yeah, they're very good in, ah, oh, it's the hand of God and it's so beautiful. And, but in the end, it wouldn't matter because AlphaGo won four to one. Lee Sudol didn't get his million. And the game of Go has been beat. So, what can we conclude? Well, the surprising thing is, nobody taught AlphaGo what a good or a bad move is. There isn't any Go logic in AlphaGo. Nobody programmed evalu an evaluation function for AlphaGo. So AlphaGo isn't an expert system. They're using this system for Go at the moment, but it's a general machine learning solution. AlphaGo learned by watching others and self-play. Nobody said this is how Go is supposed to play. It just watched games and played itself. And that's how it became so strong. And it's all done using general machine learning techniques to figure out for itself how to win at the game of Go. This is something that happened as a response of the success of AlphaGo, South Korea announced 863 million dollar investment in artificial research, artificial intelligence research, over the next five years. And then AlphaGo went silent. They didn't play any games, um, there aren't any tournaments. That was until January this year, when in online Go community, um, a new player arrived, which was called Master P. And the professional Go community was in a state of shock because this new player was able to beat everyone. All the grandmasters, all the, the, the best in the world, they all got beat. It was even that bad that this fellow, Ke Yi, he's the best Chinese player in the world. He was so disappointed, he got ill and he had to go to the hospital because he got beat at a game. A little childish, but... That's what, that's what happened. He had to go to the hospital. But now he gets his, time, he gets his chance to revenge because uh, in May 22 to 25, just a couple of days from now, there's a new tournament between AlphaGo, because Master P turned out to be AlphaGo, obviously, and KE. And they're not going to play only the traditional game where you have unlimited time, uh, not unlimited, but a lot of time. They're also going to play Blitz games and other games. But, talking about KG, nice segue, the next target for AlphaGo is actually healthcare. Their goal is to make a neural network that predicts diseases, not Go moves. And they're going to use the same network as they're using for AlphaGo. So that's, that's their main, main ambition, that's their main goal, predict, predict diseases based on a lot of input parameters predict which disease uh, certain people have. So, that's basically it. We went from tic-tac-toe to healthcare, basically. We have six minutes for questions. Jesus. <laughs> we have six minutes. Any questions? No questions.
yeah, how can you use the technology where the machine is playing itself to improve the healthcare? Um, I don't think you can. You can obviously use the, the, the input data. There's a lot of input data where you have certain parameters and eventually you see if someone was or wasn't sick. Um, but sickness also doesn't really have the problem of uh, making not the optimal move because sickness will always be the optimal move, sadly. Um, so maybe, maybe self-play isn't really, really needed in this case, but I'm not sure how they're, how they're going to do that. Yep. Uh, aren't there some uh, at least moral implications in using this for healthcare? I mean, uh, uh, when I do uh, a diagnosis, you have to also to say why you are given the diagnosis. And normally, this kind of stuff is totally opaque. So yeah. yeah. So th the, the question is, how about a moral, uh, moral, moral implications? Um, but that's, that's true for a lot of neural networks. Because the problem with neural networks is you can't really see why they are making certain decisions. Um, but that's also the case. Uh, I work for the port of Rotterdam. Um, and we're actually using a neural network to predict uh, times, arrival times. But yeah, people often complain, why are you, are you predicting I'm an hour late? That's just what we're predicting. But, but the same thing is about, uh, about mortgages. There are neural networks that predict if you can pay your mortgage. And yes, you don't want a neural network to say you can't pay your mortgage, and then you ask why not? Just because the neural network says. But in that case, I think you should use neural networks the other way around. So instead of um, just using the neural network, you can say, okay, for 80% of the people, um, the neural network says you can get the mortgage. So we don't have to look at that. We trust the neural network with the positives. For the 20% of the people that maybe don't get a mortgage or get flagged, that's when we, say, when we ask an expert to look at the case and to make a decision. And that's the same for a sickness. Um, in the trivial cases, in the positive cases, you might go uh, um, let the neural network decide. And in the cases where it's... Uh, a negative, that's where you just add an expert at that point in time and you let the expert double check what the network has. But it can still be a huge time saver. Other questions? Yep. What? I can't hear you, sorry. Okay, the, the structure of the input. Um, in case of AlphaGo, they're actually using the board itself as an input. And it's basically working like an image neural network, where you split it up into smaller pieces. That's the convolutional part of it. Um, so the input is basically the, the Go board itself and the, and the pieces on it. And that's put in a convolutional network without going into details. But that's split up until you have individual uh, nodes. And um, they're using structures. So what the neural network is seeing is certain structures in the game. So it's very visual. And that's also how, how professional Go players look at a Go board. They look at certain structures that arrive uh, during the game, and, and that's uh, how they decide if it's a good move or a bad move, or if they need some uh, defense or offense at certain points. So it's a convolutional network. Well, the question is, is there a point? Uh, it's all statistics, and it's all just weights added together. And is there a point where, where it's becoming more than that? I don't think so. Um, I think your brain is just another piece of mathematical equipment, but it's just so complicated we can't really predict. But it all depends on what, what you think it is. Um, if I look at what AlphaGo is doing, uh, for me, it's more than just a mathematical thing. It's, it's, a, it's actually making beautiful things. It's changing a game that people enjoy playing for hundreds of years in, in new ways. So for me, it's more than a, a, just a mathematical thing. And I can't see the big picture, and I can't see what's happening inside it. 
just like I can't see what's happening in your, inside your brain. So it's just the label you put on it, I think. Time's up. Thanks.